Okay, so uh, what uh, you can see happening in the world is uh, that in lots and lots of places around the world, uh, people are developing the concept of operations for uh, the unmanned traffic or for the drone traffic. So this CONOPS stands for concept of operations. People are trying to think on the conceptual level how the drone traffic should look like, uh, what should be the rules um, for the system that manages uh, this kind of traffic and uh, so on. So I guess NASA probably leads uh, the race. Uh, I guess uh, NASA was one of the first ones to come up with Conopsis and in general uh, to work on UTM. But since then, uh, lots and lots of other entities, Eurocontrol, so there's Gutma Global UTM Association or something, uh, has uh, also come up with Conopsis. Uh, you can have several Conopsis, you know, in, in Germany, in Australia, uh, also Airbus has its own blueprint. And I have links to some of the Conopsis over here. But uh, in general, if you just uh, Google for UTM CONOPS, meaning unmanned traffic management concept of operations, you will find lots and lots of documents. I don't think there is any single one which would really win this race. And in the end, uh, maybe they're not really trying to win the race. Different CONOPSes uh, look at uh, the traffic management problem from different angles. Some of them are the same, some are not, but at some point, there are probably too many conopsis. Anyway, uh, oops, I guess I clicked on the link instead of switching to the next slide. Uh, maybe it's not surprising that uh, conopsis and other work on uh, uh, unmanned traffic management uh, is so hot because, uh, well, uh, UAV unmanned aerial vehicles operations they increase. Uh, you, you can see that. Uh, everywhere. And uh, as the number of operations increases, the UTM research is also booming. Uh, one reason for that is that, well, in the academia, we try to look at uh, something which is hot. And very often, we try to look at something which is kind of futuristic. And I guess when it comes to UTM, to unmanned traffic management, to working with drones or unmanned aerial vehicles, or whatever you call them, sometimes they're called r passes remotely piloted aircraft or airborne something, uh, no aviation systems. Uh, there are many other uh, acronyms, UAS, unmanned aerial systems, small unmanned aerial systems. Anyway, uh, drones, uh, to, to, to say uh, in short. Uh, somehow the research on drones is in a sense late because uh, the drones, the technology is ready uh, to hit the skies right now, but uh, we still, don't have uh, good research or enough research on uh, drone management and the system is essentially not in place uh, like it is for the conventional air traffic management. And uh, yes, uh, a lot of work is being done all over the world, all over the world. And uh, yeah, in quite a few conferences, I'm listening here is somewhat older conference, older <laughs> by, by now, you know, three to four years means old. Uh, but I stopped keeping track of the conferences which had UTM as their main themes. Uh, a lot of conferences have the special UTM tracks. Uh, well, also the business uh, comes in and writes reports and does things and tries to deliver and other real things uh, with the drones. So altogether, uh, it's a booming area and uh, the number of operations increases and definitely hasn't hit uh, the plateau yet. And in particular, uh, in Sweden, uh, you know, the drone industry does have uh, the potential. So if you have a, some of these groundbreaking theoretical uh, work on, uh, well, how diverse the economic is and how easy it is for the product uh, to be accessible at different parts uh, of the society, uh, then uh, with all the expertise that uh, uh, Sweden has, in principle, we may expect good return on investments into different kinds of research and development, but in particular uh, in investments into the drone industry and drone traffic management. Okay, so it's a hot uh, topic and here is, uh, yeah, so on the right here I have the uh, picture from ICNS, International Conference on uh, navigation on communication navigation sorry, and surveillance 
just go, trying to work with the zoom. Uh, yes, so it was uh, de devoted to integration of unmanned IRL systems into uh, well, the usual air traffic management, into the usual ATM. And uh, yes, I mentioned that uh, these efforts uh, are ongoing on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, as usual, there are some differences in the US. You have, uh, well, more or less big players like FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, and NASA. Sometimes uh, they unite together. So uh, they, they kind of dictate what the research should uh, work on. Uh, a lot of money is uh, invested. Uh, I've been to UTM uh, forum at, in the year 2016, in November 2016. Uh, it was in Syracuse in New York. And uh, nobody less than Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York State, came onto the conference and uh, promised the $50 million uh, to put in a large strip uh, for uh, you know, experiments with drones and UTM and so on. So promised lots and lots of investments. Of course, the disclaimer is that, well, that was in 2016, one day before the elections. So I was uh, there in, in the US uh, when Trump was elected. So I don't know how, how much of these promises uh, stayed in. I didn't follow those particular developments. But in general, uh, this is how the research is often, especially the hot topics, how they are financed uh, in the US. Uh, very centralized, uh, a lot of money uh, going to universities yes, and uh, other places. In the EU, of course, with lots and lots of countries, uh, we have a, lots of smaller, more local projects. And uh, one of those projects is the project uh, I'm talking about. The good thing is that nobody tells us how the UTM system should look like. So we are really free to do whatever we want. And, well, we don't get that much money. But still, we have more flexibility and I will be showing some of the results that uh, we obtained, uh, hopefully using and not abusing this uh, flexibility. So if you go a little into the history, uh, here is uh, the newspaper, the Times, I guess. No, that's, oh, I'm not gonna tell you what, what, what newspaper it is, but uh, you can see the title. It's about a robot piloted plane really going across the Atlantic. And, uh, you know, just by the font, you can probably guess that this is not a very recent newspaper. So if you want, you can make your guesses, uh, you know, like put it in chat in Zoom or, or otherwise <laughs> mute your microphone and speak up. Which year it is, how old this thing is. When did we have it, you know, on the front line of newspapers that uh, well, unmanned planes can cross the Atlantic. So uh, here's the answer for you. It was more or less just after the World War II. So, oops, I'm sorry. So long, long time ago, uh, we already had these possibilities to go across the Atlantic with uh, unmanned aerial vehicles or whatever you want to call those things. But if you start reading this paper, you will see that, okay, to have that one single plane or whatever you want to call it, drone cross the Atlantic, there were, uh, you know, all this infrastructure, um, all these ships uh, helping uh, the plane to follow the path and so on. So, you know, if you want uh, UTM, unmanned traffic management, and if you're willing to invest lots and lots of money into it, then you can do it, or you could do it um, actually half a century ago. Of course, this is not uh, what we want. Uh, we want uh, unmanned traffic management done cheaply for cheap drones. And uh, what uh, you can see very often offered these days is that, well, you can have an arbitrary drone. Uh, you know, you can do a racing drone. You can buy parts from uh, anywhere in the world, or you can even come up with the parts yourself. And then you put these black boxes and some trackers uh, and some things that uh, will let the drones emit the signal and report its position. And uh, all of a sudden, your almost handmade drone becomes a real thing. It can be tracked. It uh, can uh, send those signals, the squawks. 
really be this kind of ADSB style. So ADSB is automatic dependent surveillance broadcast. That's the system uh, which is used uh, on the aircraft these days. Every second, an ADSB equipped aircraft uh, squawks uh, its position and many other uh, parameters. And you can get this information and understand where the airplane is. And uh, with all these devices, with all these things, uh, or subset of them put on the drone, you can turn the drone into a kind of conventional airplane in terms of uh, its ability to inform people where the drone is. So that's not bad. And things like this do make the operations of the drones safer, but uh, it's really just a fix. So you have a drone and uh, you know the drone maybe costs not too much or at least we, we want uh, the drones to cost uh, not too much because it's really the cheap drones that uh, will help the drone industry to make the difference in particular for them to be used in not so developed uh, parts of the world so you take your cheap drones and uh, well you install one thing on it and another thing on it and another tracker and another adsb uh, whatever sender receiver transceiver uh, and that kind of beats the pur purpose because we want the drone to just, well, as they say, be a flying camera or, I don't know, a delivery drone that goes from A to B and doesn't want uh, to inform people and authorities where it is. So this is not really a solution. And uh, in fact, uh, if you look in the literature, so there is something called, I think, Drone Manufacturers Alliance Europe and uh, EASA, European Aviation Safety Authority, issued its opinion about uh, drone safety. And uh, the reaction of drone manufacturers was that, well, you know, these uh, opinions from EASA, the suggestions, they remain vague, uh, not clear, and so on. And one thing is that, you know, the manufacturers, they develop a certain drone for a long time, uh, in particular, uh, you know, if you look at DJI drones, the DJI Mavic Mini, it weighs 249 grams. Why? Well, because if you have a drone uh, which weighs less than 250 grams, then uh, you don't have to certify it. Uh, you, you can just fly it. So the manufacturers put a lot of effort into designing a specific type of the drone. And then all of a sudden you have to retrofit uh, all or even one of these uh, things, these uh, black boxes, trackers, and um, other things to make your drone usable or airworthy. Uh, that's not what the manufacturers want. They really want some simple rules. And uh, that's not what's going to happen if you put uh, on every drone lots and lots of trackers and other things. So this is kind of uh, the problems that we are trying to address with our UTM OK. Uh, project. Uh, so UTM stands for UT UTM, OK stands for Optimarium Capacity. Uh, uh, we're trying to understand what the capacity of the airspace is and do the capacity estimation uh, for the drone traffic and uh, understand, well, how much traffic can we allow before certain bad things happen? And there could be many definitions of what a bad thing is, and I will go into details of some of them. And we have to work on the different assumptions of uh, how good the drones are, uh, how they operate, what is the management, what, what the management paradigm is, and so on. And uh, what we want to do, and I will explain why, is that we want to really focus on the uncontrolled class G airspace, urban, very low level. So up to 400 feet or 150 meters, something of that um, kind. And we really, what we really want to do is we want to provide this bridge between the manufacturers and regulators. So for the manufacturers, uh, we want to know what hardware they have to use, uh, you know, what uh, uh, conflict detection resolution capabilities uh, the drones uh, have to have and so on. And for the regulators, we hope to answer the questions of, yes, how much drone traffic could be allowed and what the manufacturers should do in order for the drones to be uh, airworthy and uh, so on. And just to cite uh, Sh Frank Schubert, uh, I forgot, he, he's somebody from Skyguide from Switzerland, when technology is right, regulation is light. So we don't want heavy regulation 
we want the right technology and we have to understand what it means for the technology to be right and how light the regulations uh, may then be. So uh, one thing is that we are not doing it alone. So we are doing it together with LFV, the Swedish uh, Navigation Service Provider and the Traffic Market is uh, financing this uh, project. So we have all this knowledge and optimization algorithms and uh, other engineering things. Uh, we have reference group uh, with industrial experts uh, and uh, a lot of practitioners. So uh, yeah, we work closely, uh, not being only constrained to the academic world. Uh, we have had quite some exposure uh, while well, we had our own kind of show at the Visual Sweden uh, event uh, right here in the shopping in the visualization center. Uh, we had interviews in the local news. Uh, we had parts of interviews, uh, you know, in the global news uh, here and also here we were co uh, collaborating with the US researchers. I will speak more uh, on that. So uh, we got some exposure. And in fact, uh, our latest <laughs> uh, paper on drones, uh, of course, we were reacting to the Corona crisis and uh, we were coming up with the, um, well, with the ways to deliver tests using drones uh, to cut uh, the spread of uh, Corona. And uh, well, our paper was featured in Daily Mail. So, you know, that's uh, yeah, it's a qu qu questionable, uh, achievement uh, but still it does go into the general public uh, and to this well like i would say probably mid class uh, people who don't care much about research but all of a sudden it makes a hit so we got some visibility in different circles and of course we also do lots and lots of purely academic uh, work so here are the publications from utmok and this other project pbm for utm about which i may uh, say and uh, each of these bullets, each of these papers has slides and I can speak about it for, you know, for at least half an hour. But uh, in uh, this uh, presentation, I will just go further and speak about the main results and main questions that uh, we have addressed. Okay, so if you look at all these uh, conopsis and all these concept of operations issued by NASA or control and others, I was given some examples on the very first slide, then what they seem to want to do is to make UTM similar to ATM, to the conventional air traffic management. And if you know, in the conventional air traffic management, the aircraft, uh, of course, they have the flight plans and they submit the flight plans. There is really a central system, uh, wherever it is, uh, in FAA or in Brussels, in the CMFU, Central Flow Management Unit, CFMU. Uh, so, you know, whoever manages the airspace has the full information about uh, all the aircraft or at least about the flight plans. And uh, there is a lot of uh, conflict checking that uh, goes on. The air traffic controllers, they watch the aircraft flying, trying to avoid the conflicts. If there are conflicts, then, uh, you know, you can have ground delay. The aircraft may sit on the ground before the airspace clears and there is a lot of conflict detection resolution that is uh, going on while the aircraft are airborne in the air. So this is how the ATM looks like and this is what the conopsis want for UTM. And I have a name for such a you know, common unmanned integrated system management and uh, maybe this is not what we really want to have as our UTM but if you do look inside, you know, these conopsis, so NASA conops papers, uh, paper, it lists several principles. And uh, here is an excerpt from, from the principle four, that the drones and the operators and systems have awareness of all constraints in the airspace and all the people, animals and structures on the ground, you know, and uh, you can make your guesses and uh, have lots and lots of jokes uh, over a year. So really, all animals, the UTM system has to know about all animals, do you mean the flies and mice or large animals, elephants and so on. So somewhat unrealistic, I would say, uh, to expect uh, yeah, this kind of awareness, this kind of centralization, uh, this kind of system that really has all this uh, information that manages it and manages the airspace. I guess uh, it's, well, maybe a good target, but I would say, uh, 
could not be achieved at least not very soon. So instead, so instead of this harsh regulation with all this, uh, you know, registration flight plans and um, obedient users and uh, other things. So what we want to look at is it kind of minimal UTM. What is the smallest set of rules that, uh, you know, the drones have to follow when we will have uh, the conflicts and what are the simplest ways to manage them? So we're really looking at the distributed system or the one that has, well, as much as possible of vehicle to vehicle communication. So conflict detection resolution, uh, well, whatever the name is, detect and avoid, sense and avoid, all these systems could be in place and we want to quantify how good these systems should be in order to avoid conflicts. And uh, so this is the, the project that really concerns this minimal possible UTM and all the other things, restrictions in particular geofence in certain places uh, and maybe talking about larger drones like, uh, well, drone taxis if you want, uh, well, we would address them in the follow-up projects. But for now we are concentrated just on this minimal UTM. That's uh, the goal of the UTMK project. And uh, we are not the only ones uh, who speak about, you know, these decentralized uh, control system and the separation. They should be the responsibility of the users, lead drones or drone operators, not the UTM. And they should automatically detect and solve uh, conflicts and so on. And other conopsis also start talking about distributed uh, versions. And even NASA has this updated vision that yeah, information will be shared between the users, not necessarily having the central authority and so on. So these ideas that the central system will probably not uh, be the one that, uh, that survives, uh, it starts uh, getting into everybody's mind. So a little bit of history. Uh, this is how this project started. So DASC is this uh, digital avionics uh, systems conference. Oops, sorry. Which uh, took, well, it, it takes place every year. In particular, in uh, 2016, it took place in Sacramento and it was really devoted to UTM and uh, such kind of traffic. And uh, we were several people from Sweden at uh, DESK 2016. Uh, so that's me, that's uh, Jonas Lundberg. Uh, he, I don't know if you've had a course uh, from him. He works uh, across uh, the river from me in the visualization department, media and technology. And uh, this is uh, Billy Josephson. Billy Josephson. He is from LFV. You can see the orange uh, LFV, the Swedish Air Navigation Service Provider. And this guy, Dr. Pajamal Kapardakar, uh, he goes by PK. Uh, he is one of the best known people in uh, UTM. He is with NASA. Uh, he does a, a lot of work in aviation, and in particular, he did. Uh, he he was and still is the NASA's uh, UTM project principal investigator. He's kind of the main man uh, in the world who well, promotes different uh, ideas and uh, shares NASA's view quite um, actively. In fact. Uh, uh, this year, uh, well, I mean, if not for the Corona crisis, uh, PK would have been here in North Shopping right now because we were planning his uh, visit and he would be teaching here and, and giving a few courses, in particular in UTM, but unfortunately that hasn't happened, but maybe he will uh, still come in. Anyway, uh, that's PK and uh, that's the 2016 meeting. And at that time, uh, NASA was promoting the so-called technology capability levels, TCL level, uh, TCLs. TCL one was rural drone traffic, uh, low density, and then they would go to rural high density, urban low density, and finally to the urban high density traffic. So several technology capability levels. And in 2016, I guess they were done with the TCL one and we're going towards TCL two. So anyway, continue with the history. After this meeting, Jonas and myself uh, went uh, into a jacuzzi and don't worry, I'm not gonna show you a picture of that. And uh, well, you know, with uh, plus 36 in the air, plus 36 in the water, good, mind, uh, good uh, thoughts start flowing into minds. Uh, maybe that's something that we need to have on campus, these uh, jacuzzis. Anyway, so Jonas had this great idea 
that we shouldn't really follow NASA because we will never be able to um, well, catch up with NASA and we should go to uh, the technology capability level four to dense urban drone traffic. I mean, of course, we didn't trash NASA completely. In particular, uh, we looked at uh, what PK uh, was uh, asking for from the research community and we, we keep uh, collaborating with NASA and well, they, in a sense, they lead us uh, also, well, so much for our freedom, but still it's our choice to um, fo follow general directions from NASA. So anyway, uh, the questions that PK was raising back then, I, I think they are still um, are important questions for UTM, is to understand uh, what is the capacity of the airspace in terms of the volume or, you know, the volume of the traffic, how often you would have uh, collisions or uh, conflicts in terms of noise and internal spectrum. And these are essentially the uh, questions that uh, we've been addressing within this project. And now I will show you some results. That's how the research work goes. You sit in jacuzzi, then you have results. No, of course not. I mean, uh, there are lots of our students that uh, worked with us uh, to make this happen. Uh, we also got helped uh, a lot by colleagues from the US, from uh, Berkeley. And anyway, here are some of the results. Uh, here on the left, uh, I have the noise map. I will not uh, stop on it for very long. Well, these are noise contours of a North Shopping. So this is the map of North Shopping. The uh, heat map underneath is the population density. And uh, these lines are the noise contours. And you can probably see what the, the decibels are in there. Uh, somehow the noise uh, seemed to be not the main capacitor limiting factor. So we didn't work too much on the noise. Uh, then we looked at uh, the, uh, well, the probability of spectrum jamming. So uh, on, for this graph on the left, uh, I will spend a bit more time on it. It doesn't matter really what values you have here uh, on the y axis, but let me explain what the axes are. So on the x axis, uh, I have the projected number of operations. Maybe we'll have 10 operations per day, maybe 100, maybe 1000. So this is a logarithmic scale for the projected number of operations, which I call n. And uh, for any uh, number of operations, we were modeling the flights and uh, trying to understand how much of the spectrum would uh, you need to use. And uh, what we were measuring in our experiments is the probability of uh, jamming, probability that the capacity of uh, the network will not be enough to handle that many um, drones during a day. Well, I mean, we, we made some assumptions uh, about what drones are doing uh, and so on and so forth. And we looked at different networks. Of course, whether you are jammed depends on what kind of network uh, you are using. But anyway, for any particular network, we were looking, you know, at certain value of the projected traffic and trying to understand what would be the probability that uh, the uh, particular network will not be able to handle that traffic. And as I said, I don't really want you to look at these numbers. What is interesting, what we were uh, observing is that these probabilities, they really have this threshold behavior. So it's kind of for a certain time or for a certain traffic density, you will be fine. The probability will be low, almost zero. And then the traffic density increases and the probability jumps up to essentially one. So almost surely you will be jammed. And this threshold behavior is uh, something that we observed also in the other cases. And uh, here is uh, well, a more technical result. When we are talking about drones coming into conflict, how do we define a conflict? Well, we say that every drone is, you know, surrounded by a disk. So we model drones as disks. Uh, this is also standard for the uh, conventional air traffic management when every aircraft is surrounded by the so-called protected airspace zone or PAS. So this PAS uh, is a disk of certain radius. And uh, again, we were doing these graphs in the simulations. We were looking at different traffic densities and trying to see the probability for certain traffic density for having some kind of concepts. 
so conflicts like this, or there are different definitions of conflicts, but more or less you need to have these protected airspace zones to overlap. And uh, these protected airspace zones, they account for you know, communications, uh, navigation and surveillance errors. So essentially the drone is assumed to be in the center of the disk, but it can be anywhere in the disk. And this drone may be here, this other drone may be here. So if the disks overlap, if these red disks overlap, then two drones can actually um, intersect, okay, it can collide, that's not good. And we were looking at different definitions of what the conflict means. Uh, and again, uh, outputting these graphs of probability of uh, observing certain cluster size, again, probability of conflict, uh, depending on traffic density. And again, we saw quite sharp thresholds. So we were doing these experiments for different values of this conflict radius. We decrease the conflict radius, also observe the threshold, of course, the uh, threshold would move to the right. For smaller conflict radius, uh, you can tolerate higher traffic densities or higher number of drones. So we're doing these experiments for various radii or conflict radii for the drones and eventually producing graphs like this. So this is kind of the final output of uh, our experiments and this is the graph in which I will stay for some time and actually there is a single take-home message from uh, this project. It's well, essentially this graph. So uh, here on the left I just have this well three-dimensional graph where on the axis I have again the traffic density and the conflict radius and on the z-axis I have the probability of uh, observing a conflict. And here on the right uh, I have the same graph but you know just if you look from the top. So you know th there is no need to really look at the fine structure of how the function looks over here. Essentially the function is either zero or one. So either you are safe and uh, you have essentially zero probability of uh, observing the conflict or you're unsafe. The probability of having a conflict is essentially one. And what it tells you is that, well, there is pretty sharp threshold. So this, it, it's not exactly, you know, vertical, but it's pretty sharp threshold. And this line or this area, which bounds, which, which is the boundary between the safe and unsafe is kind of the capacity limit. So for any particular, you know, traffic density, you know how good your drones should be, how small should the radius be before you hit the unsafe zone. And similarly, for any value of equipage, so I don't know if your conflict radius is 200 meters, you can tolerate this much traffic, this much traffic. Well, this is already bad. This is certainly bad. So you know when you are crossing into the unsafe area. Or in other words, uh, coming back to my question of minimal UTM, over here, you don't even need UTM. So I can be your UTM. I can be selling the insurances for any kind of conflicts between the drones. And remember, over here, I'm not saying that the drones will necessarily collide and there will be loss of hull and I would have to pay for the loss of the drone or whatever was, you know, pizza or camera, whatever that drone costed. Over here, I'm only saying that the drones would come within, I don't know, whatever this is, radius, 100 to 200 meters. And when they do come into this conflict, well, they still don't collide. You can invoke uh, the detect and avoid, the CDNR, the conflict action resolution, and so on. So collisions, so real collisions and loss of hull would happen even more rare. And I already have almost zero probabilities, even for the drones coming into the conflict. So I'm saying there is no UTM is needed if you are in this area, if you have low traffic density and or uh, good uh, com communications and maneuverability of the drones so that the radius is small. And on the contrary, over here, I would be buying insurances. You know, if there is traffic density like this, I know that there will be conflicts um, and you cannot tolerate such high density or such uh, large radii. So that's uh, one lesson from uh, uh, what uh, we've been searching and researching. Another lesson is that I claim that here on uh, these pictures, in particular, well, on, on this picture on the right, you do have UTM, I don't know what, what version you want to call it, 
UTM version 0.1. So specifically, you can say, well, you know, maybe you don't have a very well equipped drones and, uh, you know, they have this conflict radius equal to 200 meters and uh, your traffic grows. And what we know from uh, our research is that, well, the fact that you have few conflicts here and here and here doesn't mean that you forever will continue having few conflicts. No, at some point when the number of drones increases, the traffic density increases, you will cross the threshold and you will be in the unsafe area. And as the unmanned traffic manager, as the air navigation service provider, what can you do? Well, you can try to push this back. You can kind of say, well, you know, let's not fly, but we do want the drones to fly or at least, uh, you know, deciding who flies, who doesn't fly. Well, that kind of limits the number of operations. We do want the number of operations to be large. So what else can we do to get into the safe zone? Well, we can decrease the radius, right? And that's what the UTM can actually do. And you may say, well, you know, for decreasing the radius, you probably need to install new equipment on the drones or at least new algorithms that uh, would let them you know, uh, avoid each other with a much smaller conflict zone radius. How do you do that? Well, the thing is that also in general aviation, but uh, in particular with the drones, it's not really the radius uh, or the distance between the aircraft or drones that uh, is the measure of the conflict. Very often is the time before the closest approach. So in particular, if you reduce the drone's speed, it's like reducing the radius, this conflict radius. Because while well, the drones stay in place, they have all the time in the world to deconflict themselves. So the conflict radius is well, really the physical radius of the drone. So in principle, what the UTM system could do, and that's uh, the only uh, functionality that you need, is to send the signal to all the drones, you know, fly with half speed or whatever it is, with one third or one fourth of the speed. Well, eventually you can also ask everybody to hover and come to a complete stall, but then, yeah, well, the, the drones wouldn't fly then. But anyway, if your UTM system is able to send this signal to all the drones and all the drones are able to follow it, well, that's the one and only functionality that you need. So that's your minimal UTM. You let the drones fly and kind of hope for the best. Uh, when, the, when the density is low, then the probability of conflict is low. If at any point the density is too high and you know this point because you know the threshold curves, then you say, well, everybody fly with smaller speed. And that's our suggestion for, for the UTM. So again, as I said, I'm spending a lot of time on the, this slide and in particular on this picture. A uh, few lessons, the rough thresholds and they define the capacity of the airspace. Maybe an even more important, well, I don't know if it's a, a lesson or something that we really want uh, people to know, to embrace is that well, the, this view that uh, you will have no conflicts, that uh, everything will be deterministic and perfect, that's probably too much to hope for. We have to embrace you know, the stochasticity. So we have to understand that uh, we will have some probabilities of bad things happening. Uh, what we have to do is we have to understand what these probabilities are. We have to have the way to quantify them and to use these probabilities to mitigate the conflicts and uh, to work in particular to increase the capacity of the airspace. And probability again, probability is not bad. You know, if we really want the UTM to have no collisions between the drones, never ever, well, that's really not possible with malicious users, right? You can take one drone in my one hand, another drone in my other hand, and just collide them. So, okay, you had a collision between two drones, well, UTM system fails. Well, that's probably not the model in which you want to work. 
if you don't have maliciousness, if you have these random users that, yeah, they all operate on some strange plans, uh, they go in and out randomly, well, the randomness is your friend. You will have probabilities of uh, conflicts, but the probabilities will be low. So uh, yes, managing these probabilities is probably what we really want to have as the take home message from uh, this project. So uh, I see it's 4.02 now, so I guess uh, I will, well, I'll, um, so yes, uh, again, to repeat, uh, this picture is a kind of main uh, take home message from uh, our work that there are capacity thresholds and uh, if you do things right, then you can use them to manage your traffic to understand when you go over the capacity, but also understand how to go back uh, under the capacity limit. So, uh, well, the next question is, what do you do if, uh, well, your measures uh, that you were taking, uh, they didn't really prevent the conflicts. And uh, as uh, I said, we don't claim that we can do the management so well that there will be no conflicts whatsoever. The conflicts will happen from time to time. Now, how do you manage them? And again, we want to manage the conflicts in the simplest possible way. And uh, uh, one way in which uh, we are suggesting to manage the conflicts, we want uh, the conflict management to be fully decentralized. Uh, that is no central authorities telling us what to do. And uh, we want to use something called G GDP. GDP stands for ground delay uh, program uh, for the conventional aviation. That's a very well-known uh, program, which essentially replaced the airborne conflict uh, detection resolution with waiting on the ground and saved lots and lots of money. Uh, for the aviation. So what we want to uh, do here is uh, to have the simplest way of conflict management. Uh, I will play the video now. I'm not sure how well it will uh, play over Zoom, but uh, while you have the slides and uh, there is a link to this video so you can play it for yourself. What we do is that uh, these uh, small red disks are the drones. And whenever two disks come into contact, meaning that the drones um, conflict, we enclose the two disks into a larger disk, uh, this red, di well, red circle, and uh, we tell all the other drones don't come into this circle. So we are, resol we, are to, we are resolving the conflict in here, well, you shouldn't come in. That's kind of the simplest uh, kind of a geofence, uh, just a circular shape here is the center, stay clear of a certain radius. So what can be simpler? And if other drones cannot do that because, uh, well, maybe they also have their disk uh, where, where they are deconflicting themselves, or maybe they flying and they intersecting uh, the disk where two drones are already deconflicting, then we enclose the three drones into even larger disks. And so these red disks, they can grow and grow larger and larger and larger because they, you know, they collide with each other and uh, they grow. But sometimes the drones come out of the disk after the deconfliction. Uh, so some disks shrink or essentially disappear. And uh, that again has kind of domino effect. Other disks disappear and so on. And uh, we let the drones fly. If they're airborne, they just fly until they well, hit a disk when they still continue flying, but just uh, now are in a conflict. Uh, and what we do not allow, and, and this is what the ground delay program is, if uh, there is a conflict right above you, if you're about to take off and you are inside one of these red circles, then don't take off, don't fly into a conflict. So that's uh, essentially what, uh, what our tactics or whatever our paradigm is. And now I will play the video, uh, hopefully you'll see it. Uh, essentially, it shows uh, how the, you know, how these disks evolve over time. Of course, this is fast time simulation. So this is about half an hour of uh, traffic over North Shopping. So yeah, these drones fly and the disks uh, start intersecting and getting enclosed into larger disks every so often. And sometimes, well, 
sorry, the whole city is covered in conflict, so nobody takes off. But that doesn't happen too often. And at least we have uh, the ways to quantify how often it happens, uh, where it happens and for how long. So that's our simplest uh, decentralized uh, GDP. I guess I will skip uh, this slide. Uh, well, this uh, static versus dynamic, the uh, larger red disks, so actually red circles here, they um, can be following the drone, so we can just stay in place. Uh, I won't go into uh, those details. Uh, other things that uh, we may do in order to resolve conflict is uh, to use this paradigm, uh, widely used in aviation of assigning different uh, drones or conflicting vehicles to different layers. Of course, this is what you have with the flight levels. Um, and well, you can have single layer or multi-layer setup. And in uh, both cases, you can have centralized system or distributed system, which essentially gives you four possible uh, traffic management paradigms or deconfliction paradigms. So the centralized system with a single layer is a ground delay. You don't let the drones fly uh, if they are in a conflict. Then centralized multi-layer system is you're assigning every drone to a layer so that uh, the drones in different layers uh, do not uh, conflict. Uh, and then there is distributed thing when the drones just start flying with no flight plan submitted to central thing or whatever. And in the single layer, when there is a conflict, the drones uh, start hoovering or one of the drones hoovers while the uh, other passes by. And in the distributed and multi-layer uh, system, uh, again, the drones start flying. Uh, when they are about to become into conflict, one of them descends uh, and then continues on the lower layer. So a picture is worth a thousand of words. And here is an animation that uh, a student of mine prepared with these uh, four different paradigms. So here uh, you have this ground delay. If you know the drone uh, projects to uh, conflict with another drone, then it waits until the other drone passes and then it flies. So this one is, uh, well, again, same thing. If the drones are projecting to um, uh, conflict, then you assign a different layer to one of the drones and they deconflict by flying in different layers. So here is a distributed thing. If they start colliding, one of the drones hoovers on the lower layer and then comes back and uh, flies. And uh, finally over here, same thing. If the drones are in conflict, one of them goes down but continues on uh, this lower layer. So this kind of graphical or animational representations of the four paradigms. And again, uh, we'll look at traffic under these different paradigms. And uh, while well, I'm sparing you the details of what we discovered, but uh, these are some of the management um, actions that you can take in order to um, manage the unmanned traffic. So uh, that's the last slide for the UTMOK project. And uh, the rest uh, is more or less about the next step, the PBN for UTM. PBN is performance-based uh, navigation. This uh, overreaching paradigm for ATM modernization. Essentially what PBN is about is uh, that different users or different aircraft have different performance and hence they can get different services. So essentially the ATM, uh, the classical ATM, is you know one size fits all. Uh, if you look at you know, any waypoints uh, or any procedures in the airport, well, there are certain stars, standard arrival routes or SIDs, uh, standard instrument departure routes. And the assumption is that any aircraft, no matter how well or badly it is equipped, will take the same path. Well, sometimes on these charts, you can see, I, I think in Bromma, in one of the charts, I saw this little arrow saying, well, slow traffic, keep right immediately so that the fast traffic can, can overtake you. But in general, the aviation was kind of tailored to the worst user, uh, well, which is uh, suboptimal. And PBN, performance-based navigation, kind of uh, acknowledges that the users are different and uh, tries to well, take, take it into account and give better services to 
better equipped users. And the drones are different. Uh, we know that from the very beginning. Uh, so how to do the performance-based navigation for drones, it probably should be decided, well, er better earlier than later because retrofitting performance-based services is hard uh, when you do uh, try to retrofit into the existing system as the case is with ATM. 